Thank you. Well, thank you everybody for making time to join us today for this first candidate forum with Blake Moore. I'm Matthew Wapit. I'm the executive director of the Utah State University Center for Persons with Disabilities. We are Utah's University Center for Excellence in Developmental Disabilities uh, and have a, actually this year, a 48 year history of really leadership, uh, training, research and service in the field of disabilities in general. Uh, we, one of the big things that we've done historically is policy work and trying to support policymakers on the local, state, and national level. And so as part of the upcoming election, uh, we wanted to take some time for each of the candidates to really share their thoughts on disability and social policy with those of us who work in the field, those of us who are directly impacted by disability, uh, and those of us who may be impacted by disability in the future. Um, so we want to thank everybody who's made the time to attend this and we'd like to thank uh, Blake Moore for taking the time to answer our questions. I'm going to turn the time over now to Aubrey Snyder, who is going to take care of some housekeeping for us and then we'll move into our uh, questions. Hi, good afternoon everyone. Thank you for joining us. Um, the first housekeeping item I want to go through is accessibility. You will notice that we have a live sign language interpreter with us today. Thank you. Uh, Jennifer Harvey for doing that for us. Um, in order to ensure that you can see Jen Harvey at all times interpreting, um, you can either choose to view your Zoom screen in a gallery view, which you can find on the top right hand corner of your Zoom screen, or uh, to pin her video, which you can also find under her name under ASL interpreter uh, on the three small dots. And there's also a document in the chat uh, that shows you directions on how to do both of those so you can see her at all times. We also have uh, a live captioner going and so if you need captioning please feel free to turn those on just by clicking close the closed caption button at the bottom uh, right hand corner of your zoom screen. Um, the next housekeeping item I want to go through is just noticing that your mic and video is turned off and if you will keep it that way just so that we can ensure that there is a focus on our speakers um, and that our attention is there. And then last but not least, um, if time permits, we will have a question and answer session at the end of this. Um, you will notice that the chat will all be directing um, towards me, the host, and I will ask questions at the end if time permits. Okay, so if you have questions or concerns about anything, please feel free to throw those into the chat. Um, and I'm sorry, this is my last thing. Please notice that we will be recording this um, session today and it will be going up on the Center for Persons with Disabilities um, policy webpage at the end that you can share with others uh, or go back if you missed anything. All right, and I will turn the time back. Oh, I'm so sorry, one more thing. I'm gonna be uh, going ahead and reading the bio for Mr. Blake Moore, who we have with us today. Um, thank you again, Mr. Moore. Uh, just to recap for you guys, Mr. Moore is running on the Republican ballot as the in the first congressional district uh, election here in Utah. So born and raised in Ogden, Utah, Blake Moore learned responsibility and hard work from his dad and optimism and service from his mom. As a young man, sports taught him the importance of relying on teammates and how constant improvement is possible. During his senior year, Blake was awarded the Wendy's National High School Heisman, an award honoring high school seniors for athletics, academics, and citizenship. This brought all sorts of unexpected experiences from articles in church magazines to being honored by Governor Levitt and the Utah legislature to the late mayor, Glenn J. Meekham, dedicating December 23rd as Blake Moore Day in Ogden. What he remembers most, however, was a brief conversation with a Heisman trustee after the ceremony. The trustee mentioned that it was his Eagle Scout and other service projects that set him apart. Blake remembered thinking at that moment, I'm not special, that's just the way we raise kids in Northern Utah. After graduating high school, Blake signed a scholarship to play as the quarterback at Utah State University for mentor and friend, Coach Dave Arslanian. Blake served a mission for the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints in Seoul, South Korea, and finished his bachelor degree at the University of Utah and later obtained a master's in public policy and administration from Northwestern University. Blake married Jane Boyer in 2010. Jane is more than just supportive. She encourages Blake to take risks and pursue big things. She is reflective, spiritual, and humorous. Blake and Jane have three amazing boys, 
Max, George, and Winston. Family is everything and Blake hopes to make them proud in this campaign and the service that is to come. So thank you again, Blake, for joining us today. And I'm gonna turn the time back over to Dr. Wapit to do introductions and get us going. I can't, am I unmuted? There we go. Okay, I was struggling to unmute myself. I'm sorry about that. Um, so thank you, Aubrey, for that introduction. I wanna thank the, the policy team for pulling this together. Aubrey, who's a policy analyst here, uh, Teresa Larson, who's also a policy analyst, Bryce Byfield, who's a faculty member. And then uh, this forum will be moderated by Sachin Pavitran, who is our policy director here at the Center for Persons with Disabilities. So we have several pre-written uh, pre questions that we've sent to Mr. Moore, and Sachin will be asking those questions. And then as Aubrey pointed out at the end, we'll allow some time for some Q&A uh, if there is time available. So anyway, with that said, Sachin, please take it away. Thank you, Matt. And thank you, Mr. Moore, for making time to uh, be part of our town hall. You know, with elections coming within 60 days, I guess it's not too far out. There's a lot of conversation happening in what is important and what is going to be addressed. And you know, the disability community is a pretty uh, important community. Nationally, we have over 61 million people with disabilities, and it's a it's a it's a community that, at least I myself belong to. I'm, I'm blind, uh, and I have been part of the community all my life. But it, the important piece is, it's a community. It's a it's a community that we all will someday belong to and it's a community that we all need to pay attention to and I appreciate you taking the time to join us. I do want to start off by you know the big topic area that's you know being discussed these days the pandemic you know COVID-19 is a big uh, issue that's in everyone's mind right now and the COVID, uh, pandemic has impacted many of us in many ways, in many areas. Education being one big thing with schools opening right now, universities K through 12 opening up right now. There's a lot of worry about what that's going to look like, especially for people with disabilities, students with disabilities. What would, you know, what can happen to them and whether they're going to receive the services, students with disabilities often gets neglected in school systems because of lack of services or without having the right services. So, you know, I want to hear from you as a candidate and if you were elected to represent us in Congress, what would you do to help the students with disabilities out? What, would, what role would you, you see yourself playing to ensure that all students, whether you have a disability or not, will have access to free and appropriate education. Thanks, Sachin. Um, and Aubrey, thanks for the brief bio introduction. I'm glad you had to read that and I didn't have to. Um, I, uh, just by way of very brief addition to, to the intro, um, and then I'll, and I'll address your question, but uh, if I could say one thing that, and all folks would be able to to, to, to remember or recall from this conversation that we're having today is that I look back on the work that we've done at the federal level, and especially in our Utah delegation. And while we're nowhere near where we need to be, um, always with always chance to improve, we, we've got a federal delegation that fought for American Disabilities Act, and most recently putting in a three digit hotline. Um, I am thrilled to potentially go into that situation where we have elected officials that are in Utah at the federal level. You can't get everything done at the federal level. In fact, there's so much more that could be done as far as implementation um, it, within our communities in the state level of state government. But seeing the importance that our federal delegation has placed on this over the last few decades is really inspiring to me. And it's something that I sat next to Chris Stewart on a flight. I was going on a business trip to um, Atlanta. He was going back to DC and he and they were doing the vote the next day um, to get the three digit hotline voted. It was almost a unanimous vote. And uh, I, I got to sit with him and talk to him before I had any interest in running for Congress. 
that that was something he was going back to do. And you could tell how happy and how prideful he was that he was going to be a part of this, this unique legislation. I can't say that's the only reason I'm running for Congress, but having that experience and seeing that firsthand, a few years later when this became an, op you know, an option for me, um, I, re I recalled that, that moment that I shared with him and thought, you know what, he's doing something pretty amazing and it's good and it's going to have a positive impact on, on um, in, in the, especially in the mental health world. So uh, I'm excited to be a part of that and I'm, you know, if, I'm able, if I'm successful in this upcoming election, that will be something that I care about. To answer your question, though, in the most personal way, uh, I'm living it right now. I hindsight 2020, I should have had my wife come on this Zoom chat. She would have been much more equipped to answer this question. Um, but we have a little boy that uh, he just got he's, he's on the spectrum. He just we just got diagnosed a few months ago. Um, it was right in the middle of the campaign. It was quite a it was quite a busy, crazy few months. And then when COVID hit, you know, we had his preschool set up and they were great, but we weren't in anything too technical for him. Uh, but after all of this has taken place and we can go in and see what options we have and everything, um, this, this is not a disparaging comment because up until COVID, I felt like my boy, Winston, he's, our, he's, he's the boy, if you've seen any pictures of our campaign, he's the one that has glasses. He was always really well taken care of um, and there was options for him even before we had a diagnosis. But now that we have a diagnosis and with COVID hit, it's a real challenge right now. And um, the, the, the school system has been through a difficult time to try to figure out what to do with special needs um, with students. And it's a, it is a really, really difficult challenge. The things that I would break it down into, as we, we went through the process to, to figure out what it is that we needed, you know, it has to be teachers that are, be, that are equipped and trained in order to be able to, to, to do this and take, take part in this type of education. Um, and the resources are very, very strained right now. And uh, you know, we've all seen it unfold and we've seen all summer, you know, I spoke with many superintendents. I think the effort is there, but um, the priority definitely went to just getting school back in and not necessarily, the, the, the priority may have been somewhat overlooked with some of our special needs community. Um, and so we saw that firsthand and it wasn't that anybody was just, you know, purposely doing it at all. I don't feel that way at all, but it is the population that will sometimes get overlooked and whatever I can do, you know, in my platform to be able to, you know, just create that awareness and the importance of it to ensure that we're using federal funds in the right way that are designated for certain programs that would go and help this, this community, um, you know, ensure that accountability is in place. Uh, and so, um, accountability, making sure we have teachers and that they've received the right training uh, and the most up-to-date training, which I'm sure your group is, is heavily involved with. Um, we've also seen a shift towards an online type of capability. And if we do need to do online, um, you know, how will our websites be able to address this, 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 this common um, group of people that, that, that are going to have different needs? My boy is not going to interact uh, he loves screens, <laughs> definitely loves screens, but for him to have the focus to be able to get something out of this distance learning, it's just not, that's not going to be his, his ability to learn this way. He's progressing enormously. We're doing great. My wife is an absolute champion for this, um, but it's, it's not the environment that will work for him. So we have to be able to make sure that we can, can create a connection. Um, you know, he's not going to be able to keep a face covering on. He can do it for a few, few minutes and play around with it, but it's just not happening, right? It's just, it's something that we have to be able to address. So um, those are all the big things that I see with COVID particularly. I'm, I'm, I'm confident because of what I did see, the good work that I did see from school districts before COVID hit, that as we get back to a level of normalcy, they'll be able to re-implement some of that. But um, you, have a, you have somebody that's very sensitive and aware, and it's, it, it's hitting home for us on, on, the, on the challenges that, this, that, that exist in this capacity. Well, I appreciate you bringing your personal story into this because I think a lot of times these conversations, it's, it's hard to relate when you've never been around other people with disabilities. And it's hard to relate if you don't see how it can have an impact in, in families' lives. So I, I really appreciate you sharing that. I know it, it's hard when you're going through it and especially when it's recent. 
but we really do appreciate it. But also, I want you to know that Utah as a state, we have a lot of great resources. The, the CPD is one of the elite programs uh, in the country that has a lot of uh, services and resources. And we've been a great resource for all, all, the, all our congressional offices. And I hope if you get into office, you would you know, remember us and lean on us for some of the work you know, that you'll be doing. Um, with that said- well, It'll be personal for me then too, so. <laughs> yeah. uh, with that, I wanna uh, maybe tackle another question, you know, pre, you know, pre-pandemic, uh, unemployment, not just within Utah, but also nationally was pretty low. You know, we had one of the lowest unemployment rate nationally, and now things have changed. But one thing that an unemployment rate forgets to really take into consideration is the unemployment of people with disabilities. Often, uh, historically, uh, unemployment for people with disabilities has always been high. And, with, uh, and you, you throw in the pandemic, the COVID-19 piece into it, and that makes it even worse. You know, thinking about people with disabilities and getting people back to work, there are people with disabilities, you know, like myself, you know, I'm a contributing member of the community. I'm a taxpayer. I am disabled. There are many other people like myself who are, you know, who, who wants to do the work, but often don't get the opportunity just because of their disability. Maybe touch on, you know, as, as someone who will be representing us, you know, what are your thoughts about making sure everyone has opportunities for employment so they can become contributing members of the community. It will be rooted in taking advantage and, and looking at this COVID disruption, if you will, as a true opportunity to improve in this area. Um, we have companies now understanding that a remote workforce is much more doable that we're able to have employees work from home or a more comfortable situation for them and they're, they're contributing. And this is the, you know, the run of the mill employee that was you know, commuting into work every single day. And um, then all of a sudden they were, you know, there was a displacement that took place and we all had to go separate and we, we were able to make it work. I know our company uh, has been able to, you know, figure it out, if you will, on how we can, you know, make this work and people can you know work in a more comfortable situation we have to move that beyond just maybe a you know you know you know a parent situation where where parents responsible for you know primarily child care and still needing to work and so we make accommodations for them um, we we just have to look at this opportunity as, an, as, a, as a real chance to to make waves here so that, that will require the basics of of um, caring about it communication but using whatever platform folks have to highlight this and bring awareness to this. Um, <clears throat> I was in charge of our recruiting for three years at my consulting firm and consulting in, especially in Utah, didn't really have a great track record of, of um, enough diversity in our workplace. And what I learned from that experience was you still hire the, the qualified person that can do the job. That's not sustainable to just hire based off of in any sort of diversity category. Um, but you have to be actively willing to broaden the scope and open up that top of funnel type of recruiting pipeline and be able to go out and find that um, and, and find that talent. I've spent the last three years working in social impact. Uh, within Cicero Group, there is a practice area called social impact and the whole focus is for companies to recognize that diversity and inclusion actually produces better outcomes for your firm. If I work in a more diverse situation, I feel better about my, 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 my interactions with my colleagues. The clients that you work with are also doing the same, and so they like to see that your company's doing so they're more willing to work with you. There is a positive net impact that, that takes place when you're able to branch out and be a more diverse and inclusive um, community, and I lived that. Like I lived, I watched what we had to do as a firm to just open up new, you know, kind of like take off blinders in some ways and not just go to the, you know, business student and econ. 
You know, there's going to be somebody else that's, that's done a different type of world or had a different type of experience and the company thrives because of it. And it's a concept called shared value where there is a benefit all the way around. It's a 360 type of thing. And it's, and it's really, so I hate to say a very soft answer with awareness and willingness to, to, to accept this, but take advantage of the disruption that we've had and, 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 and open up these opportunities. So, so more people can kind of get into the, um, the world because you know, employees will have a better experience and they'll be more loyal to their, to their firm um, if they're able to, you know, to, to exist in this, in this case. So. And I, I, I like some of the, those words you threw in there because, you know, diversity and inclusion is something that we really strive after. And, you know, people, the disability population is part of the, that diverse population that, could, that makes, you know, makes, that needs to be part of the uh, conversation in making those kind of settings complete and, you know, can bring a lot of more impact in the work environment. Um, another question I want to throw at you is about uh, elections. You know, there's a lot of controversy these days about what elections is going to look like and a lot of conversations nationally, locally. You know, in Utah, we've had some great success in uh, how elections have been done. Uh, people with disabilities would love to exercise their right to vote. And Utah has, Utah has been a state that has exercised mail-in voting. Now, mail-in voting works great, but for people with disabilities, that's probably not the best option at times. And with COVID, it becomes even more complicated whether polling places are going to be open or not. You know, someone like myself, I can't do mail-in voting because, you know, I, I can't read print. And, you know, I guess I can rely on someone to vote for me in like mark the ballot for me, but that's not independent uh, voting. I can't verify who this person I'm asking is going to mark exactly what I said. But you know, we've had some great examples in Utah County, for example. Utah County has implemented some great systems to ensure that uh, you know, overseas military families and also people with disabilities within the Utah County can vote. So maybe talk a little bit about you know, making sure every citizen has access to exercise, uh, you know, exercise their right for voting. Yeah, and I, I won't add even much more to what you've done. I think you have a lot of the solutions in place. It's making sure, I would almost say the transportation is a key piece in making sure that those that need to get to a certain location to do it, um, you know, have that ability. Uh, the, the electronic voting is, it's something that we can't just, we have to embrace this at some point. We have to be able to figure out as a society we do everything else via technology and, 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 and we, how can we go about making sure that it's, it's secure? Um, you know, there's, there's, uh, this seems like probably the ideal solution. And in fact, that we piloted it. That's how I do. That's how we do the work that I've done the last decade. Pilots are key. Pilots, you, you, you learn from, you make adjustments, you test it and you get it implemented. Um, that's, that, that would be the, the direction that I would want to go and just making sure. I think, I think the facilities in which you would do this, they're, at, they're accessible for the most part, and you know, most of them are county buildings. I feel like that they've already been able to um, make sure that that takes place and lower them, lo lower them down. All, the, all those logistics uh, feel like are in place, but the transportation um, and then the electric voting, just, the electronic voting just feels like the, the, the next best step to, to making sure that it's, it's secure. And we can do that as a society. Thank you, and and I agree. Piloting is always a, a good solution to see, you know, how these systems are going to work. And you know, if you don't pilot, we're never going to learn, you know, what what can be done. Uh, I want to ask one more question before we, you know, we're almost out of time. But uh, I want to ask one more question before we see whether there's any other questions from the audience. Mental health, uh, you know, mental health issues are a big topic of discussion nationally. And in a, and it's a conversation in when it comes to regards to mental health services. You touched on the, you know, the the three digit uh, uh, number for calling for su suicide prevention that Congressman Stewart has worked on. So maybe touch on two areas, you know, mental health services and you know the role you think Congress should 
play or what you would do, you know, if you're elected. And also maybe another area to touch on is when it comes to law enforcement, there's, uh, we feel like there's a lack of understanding when it comes to law enforcement and really understanding what, how mental health has a role to play with some of the issues that we've seen that has happened. Um, you know, how can we get law enforcement understand? But if you could broadly talk about mental health and law enforcement and, you know, that kind of, in that topic. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll solve all of our uh, issues that our country's been going on, especially in law enforcement, in these next two and a half minutes. So get ready, everybody. Here we go. <laughs> you know, uh, we, we saw something really great with um, former Governor John Huntsman. He, he made mental health one of his big three. Um, everywhere he went, and I was on the campaign trail at the same time, he would talk about it constantly. And their family invested in, in, in this particular category. We just have to hold that accountable and not let that be political rhetoric and not let it be just talked about and actually implement it in, in, into our society with suicide rates you know, continually increasing. Um, we, we have to go and actually address it. We cannot let it just be campaign season where things like this get discussed. And you know, I use Huntsman as an example because they put their money where their mouth is in making sure that they were gonna invest in this particular thing. If we look down, the, you know, I think we're at a point now with as much awareness that's been brought up about it, that we as a society are looking down past, you know, down the road and around the corner thinking, okay, if we don't intervene, something's going, it's not going to just get better. We can't just address the symptoms of this and we have to address the root cause. I don't know what all that root cause is. I'm not a clinical specialist in this in any way. I just know that as politicians, we can't just say things at all during, during a uh, campaign season and not fall through. Now, of course, Governor Huntsman wasn't elected. I know Spencer Cox cares about this quite a bit and I'm sure that um, you know, all, all of the candidates that are, that are going out care about it but we need to identify specific actionable measures we can take to do what we doing. And it'll be investment and it'll be a restructuring of how some of our healthcare professionals, um, you know, how, how we're trained and how we're, how, you know, it's the specialties that folks go into. We had, uh, I have a good neighbor that's a, that's a psychiatrist and he actually came and did a big group meeting with us and for our whole company and zoomed with us and just gave us really nice, important tidbits of information. We have to reverse the stigma. The stigma, I believe, is going in the right direction, but we have to be able to, you know, provide specific ways for our parents and, 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 and people that work with children, teachers, to be able to highlight and bring up so kids feel comfortable talking about um, this type of stuff. And if we can do that at a younger age, then, it's, then we won't deal with this whole, well, why are you so ashamed that you're taking a, you know, some, some medication for, for a mental health issue when you wouldn't care if you're taking it for cancer? We have to get to that point to be able to, 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 to bring that out and make sure people are comfortable talking about it. With respect to law enforcement, we cannot continue to make every single thing a partisan issue. Everything, you know, as I talk to police officers, everybody's open to figuring out and, and improving in our improving the ways we do that what industry in the world wouldn't be interested in that we everybody is always interested in improving whether you're in banking law enforcement tech like finding ways to improve and taking feedback and input is good but when we make everything in our society you know a, a red or blue issue or you know make it so partisan and i'm speaking specifically to the fact that you know i'm running for office like that's just that's not something that you're going to get from me. I'm going to be able to dig in and get to the, the, the details and the data that get, that's involved with it and find ways to improve. And ultimately, the law enforcement thing, this is a increased training and an increased investment um, that will, will help law enforcement do their job better than, than what they've been, you know, their sweeps, we put so much on and we expect so much from our law enforcement we need to make sure that we provide them the adequate service to training and funding that, that, that um, it goes to that. I, that. That's where the answers ultimately lie. I don't have a roadmap exactly how we implement that, everything, and I don't have time to communicate that anyway. But that's the way I truly feel about this. This needs to be pragmatic, simple you know, solutions that we can find common ground with all of the stakeholders involved. 
Well, I appreciate, you know, I appreciate your responses and I, I appreciate you taking time. I know we are out of time um, and I won't be respectful for, you know, I know you you have a lot going on right now. Yeah. It would would you be willing to see whether there's any questions or? Yeah, I, can hang, I, I, I can I can I can hang on for a minute. I, let me just check my phone to make sure. I don't know where my phone is. <laughs> oh. So yeah, we can we can take a couple of questions for sure. Okay, sure. Aubrey, do you want to see whether? Yeah, I was just gonna say actually um, that I'm gonna direct us towards Matt, uh, Dr. Wapit. Um, he's got a question and then is gonna do wrap up for us. Yep. So. Yeah, so um, we appreciate your time uh, to really share your perspective with us. And so we're gonna throw, we're gonna throw a curveball at you. <laughs> <laughs> um, one of the things that one of the programs that's really important for people with disabilities is Medicaid and uh, it provides uh, home and community based services it provides health care it provides a lot of things that people with disabilities would not have access to otherwise and so uh, if you were elected um, into into office what is your what is your approach to Medicaid and um, yeah Really, that's the question. What's your approach to Medicaid? And do you have thoughts on how we can improve and maybe make it better? Yeah, what we have in Medicaid right now, the biggest issue we have in Medicaid is sometimes when it disincentivizes people from working or trying to get over an income threshold, it doesn't work. It simply, it, it, it doesn't work. It's the same concept that we had with some of our, our CARES Act. Um, while we didn't have a lot of time and we had a, you know, an immediacy of, of, of nature that was with uh, the stimulus that was provided, there is an element that it disincentivizes people from, from, from working. And as a policy, that will never have a sustainable future. And so Medicaid will come under attack because there isn't necessarily the sustainability of it and it becomes too expensive and we continue to add to our national debt. Or you know, Utah does a better job at at least keeping us in a balanced budget. But that's, that's, that's my view of, of Medicaid. Medicaid needs to exist. We must have safety nets for members of the population. What, what society in the history of Earth has ever been able to make it so every person thrived and never fell through the cracks? Are you kidding me? That does not happen. That's why, um, you know, I'm, I'm supportive. I, I but if people are going to suppress their income so they can, they can avoid the gap between where they can actually make enough to afford health insurance or they're gonna make, you know, stay under whatever line of income that keeps them on Medicaid. That gap that exists is where the real problem is, in my opinion. And people that are incentivized to, you know, if, if, if they work past and be able to create enough income for themselves and then find themselves not eligible and not able to afford it, that's where the problem is. And that's where we need to come up with the solution to, to do it. Now, uh, Prop 3 was a way to, you know, help with that gap. Um, and if we continue to get more and more in debt, so there's no way that it's going to work for the rest of history. What I want to be is an individual that can go to Congress and, and create a healthcare situation, healthcare policy that does not change whenever Congress changes back and forth. We, the American people, it's too important to the American people for us to just have a healthcare policy that whoever's in power, it, you know, this is where it oscillates in between these two. Um, and so that's, that, that's the way I, you know, believe it. It was, it was a curveball, um, but you know, we have to have something there for folks. And it's better for society for us to have a safety net and, and, and measures for people um, to be able to have it. And there's the, the disability side that gets involved in that, that, that needs to exist. That's, that's obvious, that's better. There's good policy is good for everyone. Um, and that's the part that I wanna target with Medicaid is that gap, because I think that's what's ultimately very, very damaging to, to, to people's lives is when they're disincentivized to, to, to create more income. You're on uh, mute still, doctor. Matt, you still there? Matt's letting me know he needs to unmute. Let me see if I there Okay, we there we go. I was locked out. It kept saying the host won't allow me to unmute. So Oh god. <laughs> there you go. Anyway, thank you for that that response. Now I appreciate your 
perspective on that. Um, is If people have additional questions or would like to learn more about your campaign, uh, do you have contact information or a website that folks could go to? Yep, the website is electmore.com. I'm gonna type it in here. Okay. electmore.com and you can do team at electmore.com. That's a good email that things can get routed through and we get as much responded back to as quickly as possible. Perfect. Well, we appreciate your time today. We know that you're extraordinarily busy, but um, you know, again, as Sachin pointed out, this is an important population with some important issues coming up and um, your, your thoughtful approach to it is greatly appreciated. So thank you so much. For everybody who's in attendance, if you have questions, please feel free to either shoot them to Aubrey, and Aubrey's put her contact information in the chat, aubrey.snyder at usu.edu, um, or Teresa Larson, teresa.larson at usu.edu, or you can send them directly to Mr. Moore's campaign at team at electmore.com. So with that, thank you all for your time this afternoon. If you wouldn't, if you wouldn't mind, just real briefly, you meant almost anybody that's spoken has thanked me for my time. For you all to come on in a big group setting, and then anybody that's willing to listen to this recording and, and, and hear me out and bet me, like that's the, I really appreciate that. I'm I'm trying to win an election here, and I think I've got something unique to offer and go back and do real good and be a really productive member of Congress. So I just appreciate your willingness to come and listen to me. This is what I signed up for, so I'm all in. If, you, if you're willing to listen to me and, and like what I have to say, I, I appreciate that. Please share that with your network and, uh, and, appreciate, and, and appreciate your consideration for your vote in November. Perfect. Thank you very, very much. And thank you all. And I believe, when is our, when is our next candidate forum, Aubrey? Do we want to announce that before we get off? Yeah, absolutely. So our next candidate forum will be next Thursday, September 10th, and we actually have two. So we'll be holding um, Chris Peterson, who is uh, in the gubernatorial election, and that will be from 11 to 11.30 a.m. And we're also going to be holding um, Kale Weston, who is running um, for a congressional district here in Utah from 1 to 1.30 p.m. Perfect. So if you're able to join us for those, we would Genuinely appreciate it and share that information with uh, with your network as well. So uh, any last thoughts, Sachin, before we sign off? And I'm from my end. Thank you, everyone, for making time. Thank you. Thank you, Blake. Thank you, Blake. Talk to you later. Thanks, y'all.